the title of the talk is Ethics, and uh, you will hear some of the how GR influences the title of deeper dynamics and title of event rates uh, from Michael Kest and Mr. Conesa. So um, I'll start from the basic picture of the title disruption, which is actually the Newtonian model. So um, a star uh, is scattered to enter the lost cone around the supermassive black hole. And the star is uh, usually assumed to be scattered from the sphere of influence of the supermassive black hole, so it comes in from far away and carries zero uh, bending energy. And as the star approaches closer and closer to the black hole, the side of the star closer to the black hole feels a bigger gravitational pull from the black hole as compared to the side of the star farther away from the black hole. And in, this, uh, in the center, in the frame of the center of the star, the star, the, the net force uh, on the star is stretching the star along the right direction uh, connecting the black hole and the star. And uh, in perpendicular directions, it is squeezing the star. And if the star gets too close um, to enter a region defined by the tidal disruption radius, the uh, tidal force will be bigger enough, uh, it will be bigger than the self gravity of the star. So the self gravity cannot hold the star anymore, and the star will be tidally disrupted. And in order to calculate how big that uh, tidal disruption radius is, we can calculate that using uh, when the self-gravity of the star balances the tidal force of the black hole, and that gives us the tidal disruption radius, which is a function of the mass and radius of the star, and also the mass of the supermassive black hole. And because this talk is about when uh, we need to put GR in the picture, so we need to talk about when is GR important. So uh, in what scenarios is GR important, and we have to go from Newtonian models to GR models. So if we compare the tidal disruption radius with the size of the supermassive black hole, and if the tidal disruption happens very close to the black hole, say within 20, uh, 10 to 20 gravitational radii of the supermassive black hole, then GR is important, and we have to include GR in the models. And in comparing that, uh, we can find a dimensionless, dimensionless quantity RT tilde, which is RT over uh, the gravitational radii of the size of the supermassive black hole, and we find this relative size uh, goes as the mass of the supermassive black hole to a negative power and also the mean density of the star to a negative power. This means denser stars can approach the black hole closer. And also for the same star, the more massive a black hole is, the closer the star can approach it and GR is more important. So, uh, for example, we plot this uh, relative tidal disruption radius uh, with different black hole masses, and we put uh, the scenarios like what type of stars is disrupted around, at what place around certain supermassive black holes. And we can find, uh, for example, white dwarfs will be disrupted by intermediate mass black holes in places where GR is important. And also for supermassive black holes with higher mass ranges, like bigger than a few, uh, 10 times 10 million solar masses, the disruption of main sequence stars will happen within 10 to 20 gravitational radii, and that's where we have to put GR in the future as well. So you might wonder for uh, main sequence stars with, say, a million solar mass supermassive black hole, is GR not important? So in certain cases, it can also be very important, like uh, if the star has a deep plunge, so, uh, which means if the pericenter distance is much smaller than a uh, tidal disruption radius. So even if the star is disrupted in a place where GR is not important, still the tidal stream uh, passes through the region where strong gravity influences its property and dynamics. And here we define the penetration parameter of beta, which is RT over RP. Okay, so um, what does the, the, the star do after it is disrupted? So after the tidal, star passes by the tidal disruption radius, um, the tidal debris goes, so there is going to be some squeezing phase and rebound phase, and after, shortly afterwards, tidal debris particles travel on ballistic trajectories. And because the star started from a zero binding energy, so roughly half of the star has negative, sorry, the, half the stellar debris has negative binding energy, and half of the stellar debris has positive binding energy. And this uh, positive, uh, this one's 
becomes unbound and travel on a hyperbolic orbit and just escape away. And these bound materials, they will travel on slightly different orbits depending on their uh, initial energy distribution in the star and then they eventually return to pericenter. And the rate of this bound material coming back to the pericenter for the first time is the so-called mass fallback rate. And you will hear this term uh, from time to time in this talk. And it is an important quantity. Uh, it can be calculated using a very simple relationship. DMDT can be calculated using DMDE times DEDT, while E is the bending energy of the stellar debris. And DMDE is basically the energy distribution across the star, and DEDT is purely determined by dynamics. And usually, uh, DMDE can can be taken as a constant uh, of uh, m over delta E, and delta E is the energy uh, dispersion across the star, and can be calculated using this. And when we say it is a constant, basically that means the star in the models are taken as a batch of uniform density. And of course, this is not a case in reality, but uh, if we put in real stellar models, we will find the main behavior of the fallback, of the fallback rate doesn't change too much. And DEDG, if we assume uh, this is the Newtonian model and the stellar debris travels in Newtonian orbits, then this can be calculated using simple Kepler cells. And you'll find DEDG goes as the octal period times a power minus 5 over 3, 5 over 3. And by putting the two together, uh, and we, plot, we can plot the, the mass fallback rate uh, with time like this. And you find the mass fallback rate follows a simple power law, DMDT goes as t to the order minus five thirds. And the time scale of this main decay is in roughly in the terms of a year. And the peak of the fallback rate can be bigger than uh, the Eddington rate if the supermassive black hole mass is smaller than a few times 10 million solar masses. And it is usually assumed after debris orbit back to the paracenter. Uh, soon after that, like maybe in a few orbits, the debris would secularize. And by secularize, we mean lose energy and angular momentum and settle into a Christian disk. And, um, and it is also assumed the disk viscous time scale is smaller than the, the, uh, the fallback time scale. So what orbits back goes into a disk and occurs onto the black hole. And therefore, the accretion power or the lag curve uh, would resemble the behavior of the fallback rate. And that is when people were saying uh, the lag curve follows the fallback rate at least at late times. The details of like how the circularization can happen and what is uh, the final lag curve, we don't totally understand that yet. And uh, I'm going to discuss a bit of that in this talk. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show a a uh, tidal disruption event candidate, which is uh, probably the most convincing one, the J1644. I'm sure you're going to hear more observational examples from Ryan. Um, and this one is very convincing uh, because of the energy scale is very huge. And this, this huge energy scale coming from the center of the galaxy, it cannot be explained by any other theory that we know except tidal disruption. And also the X-rays uh, observed from the speed. Uh, there are some like main peaks at the beginning, and then the main decay follows the same parallel decay as the mass fallback rate with the same index. And what is so unique with this event is we observed hard X-ray and radio emissions associated with this tidal disruption event. And the hard X-ray and the radio emission can be explained by a jet that is launched from the stellar material. So we don't know exactly how a jet can be produced in this event. But um, if we have a jet, it is inevitable that some disk structure needs to form uh, around a spinning supermassive black hole and then produce a jet using the blend frenzy neck mechanism. So that is another uh, evidence that a disk has to form. Okay, so um, uh, for this talk, I'm going to talk about how GR can influence the type of different behaviors. So the, the outline of the talk is it can influence uh, during the disruption process, it can influence the degree initial energy distribution right after disruption uh, if the, the tidal stream, uh, if the star approaches uh, the black hole very close. And also after this disruption process, 
the debris trajectories will no longer travel in Newtonian orbits. Uh, if it travels in uh, relativistic orbits, this general precession that can bring um, uh, difference from the Newtonian model. And eventually, this would give us uh, some debris polarization mechanism uh, using stream stream collision, uh, which is due to uh, GR axial motion. Well, it seems the, the nodal precession, if the black hole has a spin, is going to reduce or even totally eliminate this from happening. Okay, so uh, the first one is the debris energy distribution influenced by GR. So for this, um, I collaborated with Paul and, and Patrick and Mark. And what we did is um, we, we did a hydrodynamical simulation using gadgets with post-Newtonian corrections, including the spin terms. And we simulated a star with one solar mass disrupted by a one million solar mass supermassive black hole. And um, we did Newtonian and post-Newtonian with spin and post nuclear visible spin uh, simulations. And uh, for the, sorry here, is not for the very well. Okay, so if you remember for this one solar mass main sequence star, one million solar mass supermassive black hole, the tidal disruption radius is at one, 100 gravitational radii. And that is a Newtonian regime. But if we increase the beta parameter, then the per center distance can be very small. As for example here, if beta is 6, 0.25, the, the parasitic distance is roughly around 15. So that is a place where GR needs to take account. And here we plotted the mass snowback rate right after uh, the curve stabilized, meaning this is probably right after the squeezing rebound state. And after this, the, the debris particles will travel in pure ballistic orbits. And we plotted four curves in each figure for different beta equals 2.6, beta equals 4, and beta equals 6.25. And the yellow curve is the standard five-thirds decay. Um, the green curve is the Newtonian fallback rate. And uh, the blue and red curves are the post-Newtonian curves with spin and without spin. And I should stress with spin here, the spin value is taken to be roughly 0.99, and it is uh, the stellar orbit inclination angle is roughly 90 degrees. So it's perpendicular, uh, or it's like coming from the top or bottom of the supermassive black hole. And as you can see, the fallback rate for like where Newtonian uh, dynamics is governing, it doesn't deviate too much from uh, the post-Newtonian curves. Well, as we increase beta, they start to have some deviation, and when beta is really big, strong variety is, is taking account, is taking charge, then we can see the mass fallback rate for the post-Newtonian curves deviate a lot from the Newtonian curves. So they are no longer decaying with the same form of decay. So even in a small beta case, you see a small spike at the very beginning, or what is that? Okay, so for the small spec, <laughs> uh, can I point that out? Uh, we can, I mean, as Paul told me, we can see they see this like in post Newtonian simulations, maybe here it has merged with the moon peak. But we are we need to so I'm showing what I'm showing here is the preliminary results. We need to double check if it is a numerical artifact. Oh. Um, okay. I presume it's numerical, right? <laughs> you said flip in the Newtonian calculation too. I can't tell if the green curve is also has a flip or not. No, it doesn't it's the top no. 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 the, the very top left plot. Is the flip Wait, also top left? Top sorry, left. For, for me, top left. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, is, is the green does the green curve have a flip in it, or is it just the post newtonian It's just the post newtonian The green curve is the same as as we can see from this line, the same as like the standard curves. Okay. So uh, maybe we should ask Paul what you think of the small peak. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what I can say is like we need to double check on this peak, but we see this consistently in the simulations. So if this is indeed a, a post-Newtonian thing, it is great that like, maybe we can pick up with this from observations. But, but it never gets more than how many gravitational radii is it? Uh, so this is a hundred. Yeah. So why would you expect post-Newtonian to? Also, oh, if beta is uh, right, so here you should. See some post newtonian thing. Here beta is yeah. 2.6, so maybe it's around like 30. Maybe there is some small post newtonian effect. 
So do you have a flat distribution mass energy with your large beta, and then you have a, like, so the DM over DE is what we're using, they're all flat? It's not flat. It's, it's the real scatter model. But for Newtonian purpose, though. Uh, but not, not the bump, but I mean the DM over DE. The DM, DE, I mean, I think we use, like, this is simulated based real scatter model. I mean, for this, this one. I mean, you will see, if this is not a real stellar model, you wouldn't see this rise, this a time scale, like, graph DMN. So are you using a, are you using a wedge for your, or what are you using for your initial stellar model? Or do you have, like, a... I think we're using polytropic models. Okay. Can you have, like, five-thirds, Three, yes. It was the, the, the thing, adjusting to this uh, Geneva model of SLR, uh, SLR models, the, the, the base. <coughs> yes, and it goes through. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so this is the initial place, like right after disruption, and afterwards the, the debris particles will travel um, in ballistic orbits, and as you know, like if this is a GR orbit, it would have two types of pre GR precession, namely the axial motion and the nodal precession. And axial motion, I mean, I think everyone should know this, but uh, just to explain it again, axial motion is the events of Center on the octal plane, and this will produce like geodesics of this like rose pattern. And nodal precession is the precession of the optical plane around the spinning axis if the optical plane is not totally perpendicular to the spinning axis. And this would make the debris orbit to be three dimensional instead of continuing to be planar. And uh, the change of GR precession on orbit is not only changing the debris fallback time as you will see in Max Talk, I think. Uh, it would also have other hydrodynamical effects, like, uh, for example, the SO as simulated by Laguna oh, in 1993 using SSP simulation, they show that uh, with, for example, with absolute motion, the debris would spend more time uh, near the black hole. So it would be more perfect time near the black hole. So it would be affected by the strong gravity of the black hole more than in the Newtonian model. And this can produce like different like debris particle distribution in the strong orbit And also, uh, the GR precession of the debris trajectories links to hydro debris circularization. So, so far, uh, there have been two main mechanisms suggested to produce uh, circularization of the debris orbits. And the first one is the hydrodynamical instability when the stream passes per center. And the second one is the stream stream collision, which is purely a GR effect. And uh, for the first mechanism, this is simulated by James Wilson, who is also sitting here this year. And this happens is as the debris stream leaves the paracenter, it expands in the vertical transverse directions. And as it orbits back to the paracenter, it is compressed to be very thin. And a lot of hydrodynamical instabilities, including shocks, can happen here, like leading to uh, the loss of orbital energy. And um, so, if I remember correctly, from their simulations, it shows uh, the energy loss here in the first orbit is not big. It's roughly like one percent around a super, like a one million solar mass supermassive black hole. And that is not very effective in secularizing the tidal debris. So if we turn to the second mechanism, the collision of the streams uh, and producing shocks and circularize the tidal debris, that would depend on two things. The first thing is, of course, whether the stream can cross or not due to GR precession. And the second thing is, what is the ratio of the stream size or density if they do collide? So for example, if a very wide extended stream uh, collides with a very narrow, dense stream, then the shock is not so huge. So this is going to happen if the tidal disruption happens around a special supermassive black hole with no spin, because everything, all the motion of the debris particles is planar. And as shown by Hasaki et al. Um, in the paper this year, they did an SPH simulation um, using a pseudo Newtonian potential. And they have shown uh, that the eccentric tidal disruption events, as the stream gets longer enough and starts to cross itself, there is going to be strong collisions and shocks here, and it will circularize everything in uh, one or two orbits afterwards. Did they start with a bound orbit? They started with a bound orbit, eccentric case. Um, 
So what would happen if this is a spinning supermassive black hole, as in nature, uh, most of the black holes are assumed to be spinning, and also the star can approach the, there's no reason to assume the star can approach the black hole only along the equatorial direction. So we need to consider the land steering or another precession around a spinning black hole. And the reason that like the stream stream collision may not happen anymore is the optical plane could have processed as the, the tidal stream uh, should have self-crossed in the uh, starship case. So here I did this project with and just as Kala and Paulo Koki this year. And um, what we used is a particle code that I wrote. And it has no hydrodynamical or self gravity in the in the particle code, but we are only we were only checking the dynamical behavior of the tidal stream, assuming there is no hydrodynamical dissipation. And we checked we also checked eccentric to near parabolic uh type of disruption cases for different parameters, and here I show several uh, examples of the distribution of the degree particles at different epochs. And we will see, we find that there will be a small distance where the, the tidal stream misses itself, like at different epochs. And we need to compare that distance with the thickness of the tidal stream to conclude whether the stream will cross itself or collide with itself or not. So here for a particular setup here, for example, we plotted this missing distance in the first 70 orbits that the debris stream comes back to the paracenter. And it, it varies a lot. And to get an estimate of the thickness of the debris stream, uh, we wouldn't be able to get that from our simulation because it's a particle simulation. Yes. Are, are all the particles traveling on the same geodesic? They're not on the same geodesic. I mean, the center of the, the mass is... So when you say, like, eccentricity of 0.9, that's, the, that's just for the center star. In reality, you're right, right, a distribution. Right, that's the, the eccentricity of the star before it okay. is disrupted. So um, for the thickness of the tidal stream, we, we adopted Cochenex uh, formula. And this is assuming beta equals 1, so the, the tidal stream is still self gravitating in the transverse direction. Uh, and if you balance the thermal pressure with the self gravity of the tidal stream, you will get the height or the thickness of the tidal stream is a, is a function of the distance from the, the black hole and it has a power of one quarter. And this, I think this simulation, I mean this relationship is also confirmed in, in, in James' simulation this year. And if you just adopt that formula and we can calculate where self-crossing could have happened the thickness of the tidal stream, will be 0.04 gravitational radii. Yes. So, so what I'll caution you on that is that that formula holds after the initial encounter and calculating the height of the stream uh, after the first encounter. But on subsequent encounters, each time you're injecting a little bit more energy into the stream. So the height should get progressively larger and larger with time. It should puff up. It should puff, puff up. up. in the second and third encounter. Exactly. But so on, on orbit number 70, uh, I don't know how high the stream can be at that point. It can actually have a significant amount of energy injected by that time. Right, right. I, I agree, but we, we don't know like how it grows with encounters, right? Like no one has done a simulation to check this consistently. Right, maybe like one percent per orbit, but you know, once you're up to seventy orbits, you're at seventy percent. So we question it. Yes. Oh, okay. I'll try to accelerate. Okay. Anyway, so if you're just compare, I mean, assuming this is correct or roughly correct for the first several orbits, and if you just compare the distance with uh, the missing distance with the thickness, uh, you will find even the closest distance is still like 10 times bigger than this thickness of the tidal stream. So this would say like in the first, maybe not 70, but at least maybe 10 or like few orbits, the stream stream collision is not going to happen. And you might ask like, what if you change the parameters of the black hole, the stellar orbits? So what we did is we, for example, we tried a bunch of parameters, like we fixed everything and increased the spin of the supermassive black hole. And we find this distance goes linearly uh, as it increased the spin parameter. This is by the way the average distance in the first seven orbits. And if you fix everything and change the inclination angle of this better octal plane, and you will find the missing distance increases sinusoidally with the inclination angle. And this is consistent with the length theory or the precession formula. So if we believe in this, 
Uh, this means a nice black hole has a very small speed, like even below 0 0.05, or if the star can only approach this very small inclination angle, like within 5 degree, otherwise uh, the strip strip collision is not going to happen in a few orbits. Okay, so of course, as what Jim said, that we need to have a better calculation of the stream thickness. It's not only like after the second or third uh, encounter what will happen. We find like uh, in the simulation we did, uh, we also find the stream thickness also depends on the beta parameter. And this is the Newtonian post-Newtonian spin and post-Newtonian spin uh, showing how the thickness of the stream changes with the distance. This is how the star came in and goes out with different beta parameters. And we put the, the, the black dashed line is the Cochenex uh, HR relationship. And we find if we vary beta a bit, uh, very big around one, uh, the slope would vary. It's not as exactly the same as different beta parameters. So the bigger the beta is, the, the bigger the slope is. And this is because the, the deeper the plunge is, there's more compression near press center, and there is probably a bigger rebound. And uh, the tidal stream becomes less, more extended transversely afterwards, and it's less self-gravitating. And therefore, uh, the, the, it will expanding faster than the previous case where it is still self-gravitating in the transverse direction. So you, you've been varying beta and varying the black hole spin, and I guess maybe in the Oh, we're only varying beta. What? We are only varying beta. Ha, have, did you try varying the eccentricity of the orbit? No. I mean, this is the parabolic. I mean, this is uh, the, the simulation. Oh, these, are, these, are, these are parabolic orbits. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's the y-axis? I just can't see the... What is what, sir? The units of the y-axis. Uh, is that, uh, so it's the in terms in units the height of the thickness of the debris stream in terms of the solar radius. Okay. So like to first order we can we, there seems to be no big difference in the by GR on um, the thickness of the stream, except in this case it seems this um, the nodal precession, the debris stream expands faster than in the Newtonian or the post-Newtonian with no speed model, but again, here we need to double check things more clearly, uh, carefully. Okay, so the next step of our collaboration project is to combine the, the hydro code with the GR um, particle code. So we will still uh, simulate the initial disruption of the, uh, of the star using the, hydro, the gadget code, and then uh, after the hydro effect stops to take charge, we will propagate the GR particle. Uh, pro sorry, we will continue to propagate the debris particles using the GR particle code because this is much faster than uh, the hydro code, which basically it takes too long to to follow the debris for one full orbit around the supermassive black hole. And then with that, we can continue to check whether stream stream collision is going to happen or not for parabolic uh, tidal disruption events. Okay, so I'll draw my summary. Um, General relativity influences the tidal debris directly in terms of changing the initial energy distribution during the disruption process, and it also first uh, influence the trajectories of the debris particles when it is traveling in ballistic motion. And although we don't understand how the light curve is exactly produced um, and how it is affected by GR, but the light curve uh, should link to the details of circularization. And there should be some traces of GR like in the light curve if circularization has something to do with GR, for example, the stream stream collision due to GR's motion. Although it seems perhaps uh, the nodal precession is going to reduce the probability of stream stream collision or even eliminate it or at least slow down it. Uh, what I didn't cover in the talk is um, so say if circularization happens, then a disk is formed. And if the black hole is spinning, then there might be a jet uh, produced. Um, and of course, in the, in the accretion flow, for the accretion flow jet formation scenario around the spinning supermassive black hole, we need to put GR in the model, and that would affect the lack curve from the disk or from the jet as well. So that's my